My name is Tom Holt, and I am a professor, and I'm the director of the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University. It's an honor to be able to speak with you all today. I appreciate the opportunity. It's very infrequent that we get the opportunity to speak with our colleagues internationally, so this is a, a rare pleasure for me, so thank you. Um, I wanted to take some time to speak with you all about the way in which cybercrime is being transformed by the rise of online marketplaces. Traditionally, and as you've no doubt heard from the other speakers, cybercrime has had a very heavy emphasis on the way in which hackers and data thieves steal information and then try to monetize it in different ways. And that's very important, but there's much more to the current place where individuals can engage in crime online. The slide you see here is a website that you can visit that my research team has put together as part of our funding from George Mason University and the Department of Homeland Security in the United States. We've developed a robust research platform around illicit markets operating online. And the URL that you see here will take you to this website. We provide a variety of different white papers. They are short form research articles that you can read. And we also put out webinars and different research summaries that you can read. So if there's anything that I talk about today that you find interesting and want more information, you can visit the URL here and get that from our website. So as I mentioned, there's this very heavy focus on hacking and data theft, and that is important. There is no denying the economic consequences of computer hacking, whether it's coming from individuals or from nation states. But the way in which hacking has evolved over the last two decades has had knock-on effects, essentially transforming other types of crime. So there has been a heavy research focus on the way that hackers will sell tools and services to others, creating an essentially cybercrime as service platform where anything that you need can be leased or acquired from another individual. There's also been research focusing on what are referred to as crypto markets on the dark web. And I'll talk a little bit about the dark web in a few minutes just to clarify what that means. But what's important to note is that a lot of that research considers drug behaviors. So individuals buying illicit narcotics from online retailers. And this is quite a dichotomy that we have either a heavy emphasis on economic hacking or on drug selling behaviors. We know a lot less about all of the other ways in which real world offenses are being enabled by these online platforms. And to what extent the market operations are similar across the physical and digital spaces. Essentially, how do vendors buy, sell, and trade their goods to others? How do customers engage with those individuals? And how do they go about getting product from someone once they've completed a purchase. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is the way in which these markets are engendering offline crime and how there are parallels between both the cybercrime community in terms of hacking and malicious software and that of the physical or offline behaviors enabled by cybercrime markets. One of the key issues that arises is that the forums and shops have differential processes for engaging in commerce. In a forum, because sellers are directly competing with one another, it's a much more transparent environment. The buyers can give feedback to others in the forum and directly engage with sellers. In a shop present, or pardon me, in a shop setting, what is important to note is that the seller does not have to give any feedback to the potential buyer. Instead, the buyer has to do all of their work up front to determine anything about the seller's legitimacy and the utility of whatever it is that is for sale. So in a forum setting, there is much more transparency and ease of understanding who is a good seller and who will cheat you. 
Shops, however, remove that ability for transparency and make it much more indirect to know who is good and who is bad. And as a consequence, it's much more difficult for buyers to navigate in shop environments. But shops have proliferated in the last few years as forums are thought to be a risky environment in which to engage in transactions. Not only can you buy tools, but you can buy resources. This is an example of a dark web shop called Zero Day Today. They sell what are known as exploits. An exploit is a type of code that helps to compromise a computer. So if you are running a certain version of Windows or perhaps a certain Microsoft product, whether it's Windows, Office, or some other uh, resource, there are vulnerabilities in those programs that can be compromised by attackers. So this site enables you to actually purchase that code that will enable you to attack systems. The individual vendors in these sites sell what are sometimes known as zero-day vulnerabilities, meaning that they have not been identified and there is no way to defend against an attack using this exploit. So that's why these resources are very valuable. One thing to note is that all the prices listed here are in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, as you may know, is a type of cryptocurrency. Essentially, that means that it is an online currency that is encrypted through what's called blockchain technology. So that makes it hard to identify the individuals on either end of the transaction. And it complicates the process of tracking it across time. So this is an effective tool to, again, hide where you are, utilizing Tor and operating on the dark web, coupling that with the use of cryptocurrencies makes it extremely difficult to identify offenders and what practices they're engaging in. So I've mentioned the online issues that are out there. The social security number database is a good example of that bridge moving into physical space. In addition to that, we've also observed different resources for sale on the dark web that transcend the cyberspace environment and move into the physical. This is an example of a vendor on the dark web who offers hitman services, essentially contract violence for sale on the dark web. We've been able to identify 24 of these vendors and analyze what they sell. And across these 24, we find surprisingly that the price they offer for various types of violence in physical spaces mirrors what's been observed in the past. So even though prior research has focused on real world individuals who've associated and engaged in paid violence, we see that these vendors on the dark web mirror those price points such that they are not overwhelmingly high. Instead, they appear to be close to what an individual might expect to pay for what is clearly an illegal service. And what's interesting is that there's no evidence to date that any online hitman provider has actually engaged in real world violence. Instead, these appear to be designed to draw in unsuspecting individuals to be cheated. And I realize that sounds strange to uh, sort of talk about a service like this, but it's important to note that this is essentially a way to engage in fraud of individuals who are requesting hitman violence. You're not going to engage in these acts of violence as the vendor, but you will take money from people who think that you will give them whatever it is they're paying for. And that presents a very interesting dynamic. It can be hard for buyers to know who is legitimate and who is not. I've mentioned that on the hacking side, but that's true also on the physical side. And the hitman aspect seems to be one area where there is consistent fraud and very, very few examples of anyone legitimately offering services. And to give you a little bit more exposition on this kind of dynamic, I'll, I'll walk you through some of our analyses. But what I wanted to show you first is essentially the crime script for identity document purchasing. 
This is a criminological concept that helps us to understand how offenses occur from start to finish. And this notion of crime scripts comes from the routine activities and situational crime prevention approaches. If you're familiar with either of those theoretical frameworks, they argue that humans are rational actors and they make decisions based on the calculus of risk and reward. So in developing a crime script, it's a way to understand how a crime takes place, making the assumption that the offender and the parties involved are both rational and reasonable actors. So in this case, we focused on trying to assess the crime script for the purchase of fraudulent identity documents through online vendors. And we focused on the initiation and entry process. And what that means is how you go about actually purchasing an ID. So you have to identify a vendor. And since open and dark websites both offer these products, the customer has to determine which vendor they feel is the most reliable. At that point, they can contact the vendor. And we observe differential forms of contact, depending on whether the vendor operates on the open web or on the dark web. Dark web vendors preferred encrypted email applications, whereas our open web vendors would even list things like a WhatsApp phone number so that you could text or instant message the individual. At that point, if you're contacting a potential vendor, that means you're interested in making a purchase. At that point, you're typically required to make a payment. And that's where we shift from initiation into action. So the middle frame that you see here, the vendor actualization and doing, is the process that occurs once payment is received by a vendor. At that time, the vendor will begin to produce the document as they describe it through their website. Some took the time to say that they utilized the same printing tools, resources, holograms, any papers or physical materials needed to make the ID in the same way as the legitimate document vendors. And we are trying to assess now how that process actually works. Is it that they have insiders within government offices? Are they purchasing the paper and printing resources needed? How are they going about getting the materials needed to actually complete that purchase? Once a purchase has been made and the vendor receives their Bitcoin payment and they manufacture the ID to the specifications provided by the customer, they're then shipped out. And it's at that point where there is an exit strategy that can be implemented. In most cases, the exit process is as simple as the customer receiving the item, validating that it is correct, and then attempting to use it. Very few of our vendors said that they would offer replacements. You had to be able to demonstrate that the identity document was damaged in the shipping process or transit process. If you can show that, or if the vendor deliberately entered in wrong information, then they would manufacture one for you at no cost. But that's a very small subset of the vendors that we identified. Instead, most of them just said that once it is shipped, it is your responsibility. However, two of our vendors did not just simply offer the exit strategy of take your purchase and leave. A small proportion, those two, also offered to run what is referred to as an affiliate program. So essentially, you can become a full-time vendor for that document creator by selling IDs to others in physical space. This was especially targeted to individuals in the United States and the UK emphasizing you can sell our documents to underage people so that they can enter bars and clubs. And it's a, an effective way, they would say, to make money because you can charge your face-to-face -face customers any price that you want. They will have a set price for you as their customer to actually manufacture the goods. So you can make hundreds of dollars over what the actual cost to you is to produce the ID. And the supposition is that the vendors of the documents will make more money by working through the affiliates because they are guaranteed a certain number of transactions per month. If there is such a dynamic and diverse market for goods and services, how do we affect it? How do we actually eliminate any of these markets? 
And it's not clear how we do that. Part of it is due to the nature of advertising. As I mentioned at the start, there are forums. So a forum provides a single location for multiple vendors, but one takedown of one forum will affect everyone. But all those vendors and those customers can go to other places. They can move to decentralized shops and try to make it harder to be identified and easier to operate. In addition, the dark web operations make it harder to identify who is selling what products and where. Additionally, the actors for dark web purchases and open web to some extent as well can easily move around. And as a function of this, the efforts to actually affect the markets might be better targeted by the use of different social techniques rather than law enforcement techniques. Specifically, if we want to engage in law enforcement investigation and takedown, one option might be to go after the facilitators of illicit market operations rather than going after the vendors. The logic there is that if you can't host your website in a place, then it's that much harder for you to operate. If you can't receive payment, then both your customers and you as the vendor will be very dissatisfied because you need the money in order to keep engaging in the behavior. The value of feedback can also be leveraged against the market itself by finding ways to create fraudulent feedback to disproportionately skew an individual's reputation toward the negative as opposed to the positive. So there's a lot of different ways that we can think about it. So these are just some ways to think about what can be done to affect dark web and open web operations. But we shouldn't forget that these things are gonna continue no matter what's happening. There is such a robust market now for physical and digital goods. Anyone and everyone can find them. And it's going to continue regardless of what we do in terms of law enforcement practice. So instead, we have to think about how we can disrupt. What is the most effective way that we can mitigate market operations without necessarily having to engage in years-long investigations? The more creativity we might be able to employ, the faster we can get to effective market disruption without necessarily engaging in historically long and drawn out law enforcement operations. So with all of that having been said, um, we are still in the process of collecting our data. So if the website I mentioned at the beginning, if any of our research is of interest, anything I've talked about today, you can visit the URL at the bottom and it will show you all of our white papers and briefs and, and different training modules that we've created. Additionally, we're in the process now of doing some research looking at the networks that support these groups. And we're doing some price point comparisons between the pre-COVID period where all of our data is from and the current post-COVID period we're living in. So we're collecting data to see if there's been shifts in what's available in the market or how they're charging and receiving goods. So with that having been said, if you have any questions at all, admittedly, I know I won't be able to take questions today, but um, you can feel free to contact me via email. Um, my phone number is listed here as well, or if you're a Twitter user, I'm happy to connect with you there as well. So thank you for your time. Again, I, I greatly appreciate it. It's an honor to get to speak with all of you today. So thank you.